Please give it up for Eva Bulaya Shaman. I'm a guy, Yeah. Welcome to Broken Nose Media. Good to be here. Now with video. Yeah, apparently. Welcome back to Broken Nose Media, actually. Because remember, we're doing yeah, the, 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 the type. That means the typing, the typing interview. The typing. Now we have video. Very mm -hmm. nice. Um, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, life is good. I'm in Glasgow doing the stand this weekend. And I just got done with a yoga class, so I'm feeling all limber and open. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice one. Uh, have you seen Deadpool yet? I did. Oh, have you seen that? Uh, yeah, oh, I did. Have you oh, seen it? I did see it, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, I went in not really knowing anything about the comic book. I'm not a big comic book nerd. Uh, but I still really appreciated it, and, and I liked the fact... I liked that it also made fun of the industry. Like, even the opening credits were like, a hot girl, yeah. a hot guy, a CGI character. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought it was good. I hadn't really seen it in the comic, but I'd seen like, the build-up and stuff. And yeah, yeah. I was like, this is kind of good. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And the bit when Colossus is like dragging, like, we're going to take you to Xavier. Yeah. And he's like, McAvoy or Stewart. <laughs> that was good. Um, cool. What was the month-long food challenge that you did? Uh, I, in January, I did uh, all the, all the resolutions in one month, so I don't have to do them for the rest of the year. Uh, I did a, uh, I did three diets in one month and see how that affected my life. What was the results of that? Uh, I did lose a lot of weight. I lost 12 pounds in wow. the month. Uh, and now I'm, I would like to lose a little more weight, but now that I have the freedom to eat and do whatever I want, it's, uh, it's, it's almost more stressful because <laughs> it's like, I don't want to gain any of it back. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Mm -hmm. Wow. I saw the picture on Facebook and it was like a before and after. I was like, oh wow. Yeah. It was the before and after thing. That was, yeah. that was impressive. That's the one thing. I'm really glad I did that. And if anyone ever decides to do some weight loss, I highly suggest you take before and after pictures because like I took the before picture and just kind of put it away and didn't think about it in the day before my last weigh in. I was kind of, my boyfriend was around, I was like, I don't know, am I, does it look like I've lost weight? It, it, I, I don't feel like I have, you know, and you know how you like look at yourself and overanalyze it. Yeah. And then we took the shots the next morning and I put them side by side and I was like, oh my god, I'm like <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, cool. When you started performing stand-up comedy, what kind of comedian did you want to be? I don't think I had um, that kind of goal in mind. I knew, I mean, a funny one, <laughs> a successful one, but I didn't start out with an agenda. Like, I didn't desire to speak, like, truths or whatever. I knew I liked storytelling, and I liked, and I just automatically started telling um, stories about myself and my own life. And at that, that time, I was teaching yoga full-time, so I talked a lot about yoga. And I talked a lot about dating because I was, I was dating a lot and then I just wound up, you know, for quite a few years I've talked almost exclusively about sex because I find it interesting. <laughs> but I didn't set out to do that. It's, it's just kind of how my brain works. I think the best kind of comedy or the most authentic kind of comedy is when someone doesn't try to muscle in an agenda, be it to talk about politics or be it to like force themselves to be a one-liner. I think the best kind of comedy is when it comes from someone who thinks in one-liners. Like some people just, that's how their brain works. That's not how my brain works, so I don't really do them. Mm -hmm. um, or some people just are always batting around in their head uh, social issues and politics. So if that's always what they're thinking about, that makes sense that that's what they talk about on stage. Yeah, that's true. So. Do you remember anything from your first set? I have my first set Do you? on. A, uh, I immediately put it up on YouTube because I thought I was so fabulous, <laughs> and it is me. It's like a three-minute set at an open mic at New York City in, at the People's Improv Theater. I thought I was fabulous. It's three minutes of no one laughing. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I mean, and actually, I talked about. I brought a Bible on stage. And I read a passage from it, 
because I had a, I had, or um, might still have actually in New York, um, I was given a Bible when I was in the third grade. Our church gave everyone a Bible because I'm from Ohio. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, I, there's, there was a passage about um, God not liking homosexuality, but the way it's phrased in that Bible is just like, no man shall lie with another man semicolon god hates that like it's literally what it says and it's it was so funny to me i was just like i had to i just read that on stage it's nice. the semicolon that i just semicolon god hates that just in case you haven't understood yeah nice um i have i mean supposed to see that i got at the fringe festival yeah happy glass your man yep postcard conversions excellent poster thank you Done um, by Steve Olathorne, design and oh, yeah. photo. Yeah. I think he did. Yeah, he does back. I think yeah. he did Bit Kills one as well. Nice one. Um, so I saw you perform that show at the Fringe. Yes. Uh, the Gilded Balloon, the 2015 Fringe Festival. And, uh, <laughs> and he's really in shape. He's super fit. He's so fit, he has wings. You know? Yeah. 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 Listen, one girl's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, wings are when you're so fit. That you get these two little lines that form right here. So it goes six pack, six pack, six pack. Whoo, there's my dick. Like that's. <laughs> and I think they're so sexy, the wings. If you have wings, you can put your penis anywhere in my body. <laughs> and I mean anywhere, between my toesies and my eye sockets. You got wings, you got options. <laughs> but it was really, really good. Thank you. Um, were you happy with the show? No. Uh, in that is the first show. Like I said, I like telling stories, but I've never done an actual, like, linear, sh like an hour story show. Um, I'd say my previous shows have been kind of themed, but it's not like at the end I was trying to make a point. In that show, I really went by the Edinburgh formula where uh, you set something up and then there's a turning point and then at the 40 minute mark you bring it down and you make a point <laughs> and then you bring it back up and you end on a laugh and it was fine it wasn't my best work it was also because it was a story on shows where the audience was a bit stiff or a bit tired or a bit hot I didn't feel like I could break the, the story to like be like, you know what, let's talk to you guys for a little bit. Let's learn things about you. Because I was afraid if I miss certain beats, then the story wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know which time you came, but one time I did do the show and I forgot half of the setup for the end of the story. <laughs> it was amazing. I think it was sold out. I think you forgot like a couple of lanes or something and then you said I went back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, but, uh, no, like I got to the end and realized I never set up the <laughs> Like I only set up half the bet. It was it was an it was actually probably my favorite uh, show because something went wrong and because the audience like we kind of came together um, and got to explore the fact that I fucked up so much instead of me going up like I don't know I felt like doing an hour themed show or an hour narrative I guess it's a narrative show it it didn't feel like stand up it felt like a play. And I love theater, and I love doing plays, but if I'm going to do a play, I'd rather just do a play instead of do a stand up -y show. So part of that show had your routine, the weirdest things said after sex. Yeah. Do you mind if I draw all around you? If someone says that to you, you've just fucked a serial killer. Uh, they were so weird. Like, were they all, like, where did you get those from? I got them uh, off the internet, so you know they're all true. Um, <laughs> I went on uh, Craigslist and got some of them from strangers there, and then I also went on uh, just asked friends on Facebook, and people sent me messages. I got over sixty, and yeah. I used less. Uh, I think I only used nine in the show, um, and that's another thing. Like I, because the show had the way it worked for those of you who haven't seen it. Uh, the postquital confessions came over a loudspeaker um, and were all pre-recorded, but because uh, 
of where I was previewing and how I was previewing. There was a lot of times where I didn't have the equipment to do them over the live speaker, so I was either mm -hmm. reading them off or I didn't have enough time or I didn't allow myself enough time, put it that way, to really play with all 60 of them and explore each one. Because I could have just done 60 post quote, you know, <laughs> and done that for a minute. Show. Actually, I should have done that. That would have been interesting. But it wasn't a bad show. It just, uh, I'm fine if I never do it again. Mm, okay. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Uh, but the, the video is on YouTube, isn't it? That, Not. The Nine Weirdest. The Nine, okay, so there's a video on YouTube called The Nine Weirdest Things Said After Sex. Uh, that I did uh, with my boyfriend in my ventriloquist dummy doll. Uh, my boyfriend is filming it. He's not in it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, I did do that. The There is no film of the show. There's a 30-minute abridged version um, that I did in Tumler's Amsterdam, but there's no... Like, I have the, sh the show before that was called Abigail Shaman. It's pronounced Abigail Shaman. And that full show is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Postcoital is not. See, with French shows, is general consensus they start off pretty good, and then they get better as the run goes on because people start to learn the material more. I think so. I think they get tighter. I think even when you come to Edinburgh and you think your piece is done, they're never done. Like no, I don't think any show is ever set and finished. You can always mine more and find more uh, within the jokes, within the narrative. Um, I might have liked mine a little more if I had given myself more time to play with it. I still like those jokes. I still tell those jokes. Um, I just hated to have... I hated having to tell them in a certain order. I didn't mm. like that. Um, but yeah, I'd say shows get tighter as you go. Um, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so last time I saw you live, you mentioned that you were in Scotland during the time of the independence referendum. Sorry, I was in the UK. You were in the UK. Yeah. What was that experience like from like a London perspective? Um, you know, it was it was really interesting. Uh, there was a lot of talk about it. Uh, I run in very liberal uh, circles, so I genuinely thought that it was going to happen, and I was really excited. So did I. <laughs> to to be in the UK during such a uh, huge historical moment. And I was like, I remember waking up the next day and then hearing that it didn't go through and everyone was like, uh-huh. But um, it was so close too. I woke up hungover the next day, I had to go to work. And I was just, I sat on the couch and turned on BBC News, Scotland votes no, and I was just like, uh, this is going to be the worst day ever. Yeah. And it was a pretty bad day. Uh, anyway, uh, so you What was it like here? Was everyone really sad? It was like a carnival atmosphere in Glasgow. On the night, like I went out with my old flatmate um, to the, was like, let's go to the Yes Bar, the yeah. city centre, um, and we were out there drinking, and everyone was like, yeah, and like, like I see, I meet people from work and some friends and my cousins and stuff. I was like, yeah, let's go kind of vote yes. Um, and then the next day it was just, right, punching the dick. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> what I was in New York when uh, George W. Bush was re-elected for his second term, uh, and it was right when I started college. And the day of the election, all the volunteers were out saying, like, remember to vote, vote Democrat, vote Democrat, remember. And there was this energy in the air that, like, he's a one-term president, he won't stick around. And then, the ne and then he was elected. And the next day, you woke up and New York was just still. Like, everyone was just like, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Cool, so you're performing at the Glasgow Comedy Festival next month. Yeah. 12th of March, 2015. Uh, and your show, Abigail Shaman. 2016. 2016. 2016, yes. Yeah. And your show, Abigail Shaman, a.k.a. Abigail Shaman. Yeah. At Black that, Files. That is, a, that is a name you call a show when it you know it's going to be mostly new material. <laughs> and uh, you don't have a theme. So. A solid name. I've, I've already got my... Oh, Golden sweet. Tickets. Ah, they're so big. Sure. I know that's a weird thing to say, <laughs> but... <laughs> Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on that show so far? Uh, AKA Abigail Ashland? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm excited about coming up and doing it. It's just, it's just going to be an hour of me telling jokes and stories. It's not, like I said, it's not going to be a narrative. I'm not doing Edinburgh, I'm not t t doing a solo show this coming Edinburgh. So I don't have a lot of pressure to 
make sure it's right. Um, so I think it's going to be a lot more fun because of it. Um, nice. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. That seems to be a sort of growing thing with comedians. I think they don't do Edinburgh, they seem more happy. Yeah, well it's a lot of money, it's a lot of pressure, and you want it to be worth it, and you want to get something out of it. I, I've done, I think last year was my sixth Edinburgh, and this year I just don't have it in me to write a new hour that would be good or better than something I've done before. Like I need, I need a break, I need to recalibrate, and I, I want to bring something a little different. I'm not quite sure what that is yet, but I, in order for me to do something different, I need time to have that creative process, <laughs> as it were. That's good. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you enjoy being a stand-up comedian? Oh my god, I love it. Um, if I didn't, I wouldn't do it. I'd do something else. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, like any job, it, there's great things about it and then there's things that are really annoying about it but at the end of the day I get to work at night which is great because I don't like mornings <laughs> um, so pretty good. and you get to like your someone's event for the night like sometimes you wind up performing in front of an audience that doesn't really know what stand-up is and that that can be annoying but like people could have done anything with their Friday or Saturday evening and they've come to see you maybe because of your reputation maybe because of the reputation of the club but they you're you're their evening that's what they've chosen to do and I, I just think it's cool I like doing it awesome that's good and um, what do you think your best routine is I don't know it changes um uh the joke about my name, Abigail Shaman, it's pronounced Abigail Shaman, and um, being, I used to be called, a kid used to call me Abigail growing up, because my real name's Abigail, uh, and I have a joke about that that's about three minutes long, um, and that's probably my strongest joke. Um, I also have one that I don't do very often anymore about uh, I had an abortion and um, I have a joke about that uh, where I never say that word because it's very uncomfortable for people um, and I, I'm that's the one I'm probably proud of as far as the writing is very very clever uh, because it's a very sensitive issue mm -hmm. um, but as far as like a crowd pleaser the one about my name is probably the all right we'll just end off does this. that ever hurt doing that considering it's like go back to kids calling your names at school? Uh, when I first did it, I was really afraid that I would go off stage and people would call me Abigail. Oh, like, I, I, yeah, I was really kind of like, do I want people to know that this is what my nickname was in school? But like, we're all adults, no one's done that. Watch, tonight it'll happen for the first <laughs> time ever and I'll have to punch someone. But, uh, but yeah, sometimes when I'll do a joke or I'll say something out loud I've never said before, that's nerve wracking because it's like telling strangers a secret that you've never told anyone. So that can be nerve wracking. But then once everyone laughs about it, the power of like being made fun of as a kid, that that power, that how much it hurt my feelings as a kid, it's, it, it doesn't exist anymore because we're all just making fun of this situation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That's good. Um, so you created a few very funny videos on your YouTube channel mm -hmm. last year, uh, especially you. the How to Be a Successful Awesome Comedian Ever video. Thank you. Um, is that something you enjoy doing when off stage? I do. Um, my boyfriend is a filmmaker and so that's why this past year I was making videos which I've never really done before. We want to make more but our schedules are a little tricky. And sometimes when we hang out, the last thing we both want to do is work. Yeah. Um, I was telling you before the podcast starts, we're going to start living together. And kind of we're like, yay, we can make videos all the time now. <laughs> <laughs> That'll probably last for a week. Oh. And then we'll be like, I hate you. I'm going <laughs> to go to a coffee shop by myself. <laughs> What's been the most fun video to make of all the ones you've made so far? Uh, how to be an awesome, totally awesome comedian ever was pretty fun. With Edinburgh coming up, it's important to stay fit, so I, of course, I say stay hydrated. 
and I've started doing CrossFit, so I have to post about that on Facebook a lot, and that's a big workout. And I meditate while watching Simpsons reruns. Uh, we were in Amsterdam, and uh, I was doing shows, and Tom got to come along with me. And we show up, and they put it like that's the flat that they gave us to stay in. Like that's. Really? That's that that the what where we shot that was where I stayed while we were in Amsterdam. Oh, wow. And there was that huge bathtub. There was there was also a fireplace, but we couldn't figure out how to turn it on because <laughs> we were like, we need me sitting by the fireplace. <laughs> but um, it was uh, it was uh, this, this gorgeous flat, and uh, Tom had brought all of his equipment up to film me uh, doing the show. We didn't plan on making a video, but we walked into the flat and. Tom was like, I thought comedian, I thought you guys always drove for hours and stayed in really shitty hotels. And I was like, it's not usually like this. <laughs> this was the first time he had ever come on an excursion with me. I was like, it's not usually like this. So that's why we kind of wrote it on the idea of how comedians, we always talk about how awful and hard it is to be a comic, but sometimes it's really fucking great. <laughs> nice one. Yeah. Um, so I listened to your Namaste Bitches podcast yes. when I'm in the gym. And it's Good for the motivation because it's always been talking about being fit and healthy. Um, also, it's got a pretty good name. Thanks, you. Uh, how would you describe the podcast to people who haven't yet listened? Uh, Namaste Bitches is a wellness podcast. Uh, and I get people who are health professionals, and then I get um, kind of what I call average Joes with a passion. <laughs> so, uh, and I ask them for one piece of advice at the beginning of the podcast, and then we go from there. So I've had uh, massage therapists, yoga instructors, CrossFit coaches, uh, nutritionists, uh, doctors, uh, CBT therapists, um, art therapists on the podcast. And I, I really like listening to wellness podcasts. Sometimes they're quite boring. Um, and a lot of them are geared towards one aspect of health. So it'll be like a podcast all about paleo, or a podcast only about veganism, or a podcast about uh, just uh, running, which I think those are great. But um, I kind of wanted to create a, a podcast where you kind of get an array of opinions from different people about different things, because mm -hmm. it's health and fitness, I think, are so hard to figure out. So I tried to create a lighthearted way for us to all figure it out together. That's nice. Um, what do you think is the most surprising thing you've learned to do all those chats? I think it's been 15 episodes. Yeah. It's only 15 so far. I'm really bad about putting them out. Um, I like how you always apologize at the start. I'm, like, I'm sorry guys. <laughs> I'm, I'll be better. <laughs> I didn't realize that, but I do, because, <laughs> like... Uh, but I don't know if there's anyone going, this is terrible, there should be more. Everyone's like, oh, it was new. There's, there's a new episode. Um, I, well, I just did one with my sister, which was really interesting. Um, and I really liked talking to her, kind of about her... She's an art therapist, and how she came into art therapy, and she said some really cool things about drug therapy as well as far as if someone needs uh, antidepressants and stuff about um, her choice. She, she talked very openly about her choice to go off medication at one point of her life and why she chose to do that and uh, why it was a good thing for her. Whereas like some people should, should and need to take medication and that's fine. But you know there's so many gray lines around especially mental health. Also I did a, an interview with Dion Monsanto, who is a Bikram yoga teacher in Harlem and is a big uh, suicide prevention activist and mental health activist because her daughter committed suicide. And um, yeah, just talking to her too, she's such a powerful woman and really willing to share her story. Uh, that's so beautiful and there's just so much gray area around mental health that I think it's really cool when people are really open to talking about it in their own life and how to handle it. Because, you know, I think a lot of people don't know and they're afraid to ask and they're afraid to be judged. Mm -hmm. um, 
if they do think they want medication or need medication or even need help, even just need to go see a therapist, you know. Yeah, that's really interesting. Quick final question. Yeah. Um, where is the best place for people to find out that your upcoming gigs? Um, I have a website, abagalia.com, and I'm pr I'm pretty good at keeping that regular. Literally, as you said that, I'm like, I don't think I have my New York dates up yet. <laughs> um, but abagalia.com has uh, everything from my videos to my Twitter to the, I have a mailing list you can sign up for that I've yet to use. Um, but yeah, so abagalia.com has everything, and then of course I'm on Twitter as well, at Abigailia. If you Google my name, only I come up. That's like, true. Like, that's it. That is true. But Abigailia.com has all the information, and then Namaste Bitches, all of it is on the podcast, or excuse me, all of it is on the website, so. Cool. Well, Abigailia, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris.